right, so it is somewhat shocking that I did come from Madison and end up at AI. Although the less surprising version of that is that both of my parents are actually economists who worked in DC who also worked with AI during their careers, so that's a little less surprising. Um, but what I want to talk about today is health policy, particularly in this context of what are seen as vulnerable groups in this current policy climate. And I'm going to go through one example of policies that are being talked about right now. And we're going to go through sort of the context, the background of what is seen as the supposed problem, what is seen as the supposed solution, and what we kind of think about a couple proposed solutions, what we like, what we don't like, and then sort of take from there and uh, hopefully have some lessons that we can apply more broadly. But I want to start with a example. And the example is a hospital bill. All right, so hopefully you guys can see it. If not, not that important. The details aren't important. So this is a hospital bill that I pulled offline. Probably fake, but that's not important. So it's a hospital bill for an insured patient. In this case, it's a Medicare patient. And there are three pieces of this bill that I want to show you that are really important to the story that I'm going to be telling. So the first thing is that we've got, all right, so we've got an emergency room charge, we've got a lab charge, and a pharmacy charge, and there's this $1,500 list price on this bill. All right? The second thing I want to show you is that there are also payments on this bill. So there's payments from the insurer and there's payments from the patient. So one of the things, if you get a PhD in economics, you have to take a lot of math, and one of the things they teach you is $195 plus $168 doesn't equal $1,500, <laughs> and that's because there's this huge negotiated discount, okay? So this is something you may have seen in newspaper articles. Hospitals have these list prices that exist that bear very little relationship to what they actually get paid by most patients. This is probably a fake bill, but it's a realistic bill, and I'm going to show you it this way. So this is data from uh, all U.S. acute care hospitals, and it shows the same three things that were on that bill. The first thing is list prices, so that's called charges on this. That's the list price or charge master price of all of the services that were rendered by U.S. acute care hospitals. The dotted line represents what they actually got paid, and then the vertical distance between the two lines essentially indicates the discounts they're giving to patients, right? So we're in this really weird situation on the right hand of this graph the charges are like four times higher at an average hospital than what they actually get paid by a typical patient, which is really weird when you think about how most things work, right? That's not how CVS works. That's not how Starbucks works. I don't go into Starbucks and it says $10 for coffee and I give them two and they say sure. Like that's just not how things happen. And it's not how hospitals used to be either, right? Hospitals 40 years ago used to have list prices that are sort of like everybody else's list prices. Right, so 40 years ago, the price was the price. And if you had a bypass or whatever it might be, you paid the full list price for the bypass. I'm not going to get into the details of why this has evolved this way, but suffice it to say, that's a really dramatic shift. And there's been a lot of attention to the latter part of this graph where we have these really weird prices in healthcare. And so there's a lot of question about why ignore that for now. It's not just that they're high. If you've seen a, a newspaper article, about this issue, you've seen a picture like this. And so what you do is you take two seemingly pretty similar hospitals. In this case, we're in Miami. We're comparing the University of Miami to some Jackson Memorial Hospital. I don't know what these hospitals are, but they're 750 feet away from each other or so. And if you look at the list prices, there's crazy differences, right? So presumably, same labor market, same you know, cost of, uh, of uh, uh, property, they're saying taxes, whatever. And yet, if you have a heart attack with four stents and major complications, 90 grand at Jackson, 165 at Miami. All right, you want a pacemaker, 65 at Jackson, 125 at Miami. All right, so it's not just that prices are really high, it's that this really big increase in prices has led to tremendous variation, even very, very locally. And so the natural question to ask is, all right, so, so what? I mean, it's kind of crazy, but for most of it, it doesn't matter. Right, so most of us have insurers. So if you think back to that bill, so what? There's $1,500 on it. Medicare insulates me from that by negotiating effectively with the payer. And so it depends a little bit what kind of insurance you have. Public insurance, they basically dictate a price. So Medicare says, this is what I'm going to pay, period. Take it or leave it. Hospitals take it. Private insurers, it's a little bit more of a, a negotiation. If you're a big private insurer, you can negotiate a larger discount. If you're a small one, you can negotiate a smaller discount. But in any case, it's a much, much lower price than the actual list price. Just as an aside, list prices have gotten so crazy. It used to be common that the way a private insurer, an Aetna or Humana or whoever, 
the way they would contract is they'd say, I'll pay you 80% of list price or something like that. Well, now it's really hard to contract on something that increases like 20% a year. So what you do now is you say, well, forget that. I'm just going to pay you 50% more than Medicare pays. All right, so it's just a side note, but it's an interesting point just because Medicare has huge influences on the rest of healthcare markets in ways that you might not expect. That's one of the ways. Anytime they change a price, they start screwing around with all sorts of contracts that exist in the rest of the market. But that's just kind of a side note. All right, so so what? It doesn't matter for us, but it does matter for some people. So there's two main groups for whom list prices actually potentially matter. The first group, the one that's traditionally gotten the most attention is the uninsured. All right, so if you're uninsured, remember that hospital bill, you had the $1,500, but then you had that key insurer negotiated discount. Well, if you don't have an insurer to negotiate the discount on your behalf, you don't have the insurer negotiated discount. So all of a sudden, uninsured, sort of for bizarre reasons, are, the, are one of the few groups that are exposed to these really high list prices. All right, so the second group, surprise out of network. This is what's gotten the most attention recently in the news. So the story here is not that there's a really good doctor at some hospital that's not in my insurance network. It's that I go to an in-network hospital, I go an in-network in attending physician, and all of a sudden, in the middle of this procedure, an anesthesiologist comes in from out of the room, and they put me under, but all of, I didn't know they were at a network. All right? So the idea is that you did the right thing, you went to the in-network hospital, you went to the low-cost place, you went to your in-network physician, but somehow there's this unforeseen thing that happens that you can't anticipate. Mm -hmm. All right, and so what, what's the policy response? Well, it's not that surprising, right? This policy response is that, geez, this seems really unfair. Right? It's not just, it'd be one thing if this were like Bill Gates, he's the only guy who has to pay these bills, but it's not. It's these two really weird kind of vulnerable groups, right? The uninsured, well, number one, relatively poor, Number two, this could be people, if they're not that poor, it's in really bad situations, like I just lost my job, so I lost the insurance that goes with my job, why does that mean I get the four times higher price? Same with the added network. They just did the thing we want them to do, which is go to the low price in-network hospital. And yet somehow, they're stuck with this four times higher price, let's say. All right, so the natural response to this is, gee, that seems unfair. But I'm an economist. One of the things about economists is we're kind of jerks. And unfair doesn't really cut it. And there's a lot of things in life that are very unfair that we don't regulate. So I had a professor who used to give this example that was, you know, there's a lot of really attractive people in the world, and there's some really unattractive people in the world. That's really unfair. It's not just that it's like, oh, it looks better or something. It's the attractive person gets paid way more money over the course of a lifetime than an unattractive person. But we don't mandate subsidies for like plastic surgery. Right? And we don't disfigure people who are really good looking. We just don't regulate it. It's unfair, though. It's incredibly unfair. You have no control over that. But we don't regulate it. All right? So what does it mean to be a problem that's worth regulating? It can't just be that it's unfair. All right? And so the way I think about this is market failures versus uncomfortable equilibriums. So these aren't necessarily the technical ways you talk about these things. Certainly, uncomfortable equilibrium is something I just made up. Uh, but an uncomfortable equilibrium, what is that? That says. There's an outcome that happens from a market that I don't like, but it does reflect what people want. You know, people get to make these choices. They have free choice. They know all the information that's relevant. I just don't like the choice they've made. Well, that's very different than a, what I would call market failure. You can get a more technical, less technical definition, but for our purposes, let's think about a market failure situation where it's that the outcome isn't really reflective of, of what people want. All right? There's some sort of friction that means that we're not getting the efficient equilibrium. So what does that mean? That means there's something about the characteristics of the market. For instance, information. What if people don't have prices? If I don't have a price and I go into a car dealer and there's a Ferrari next to like a Toyota, well, Ferrari looks pretty good. It's when I, you know, ring the, when I go to the cash register and I use my credit card and all of a sudden I just pay $300,000 more, I'm kind of screwed over, right? That's not actually reflective of my preferences. Yeah, I like the Ferrari more, but I don't like a $300,000 more. And if I knew the price, I wouldn't have chosen the Ferrari. Right? I would have chosen the Toyota. And so that's one of the things that we can think of as a friction. If consumers are making choices where they don't have all of the information they need, well, then it's not clear that the choice they made really is reflective of what they want. All right? So the question is, it's not 
is this unfair? Is there a market failure here is what I would say. And I'm actually going to argue there is. All right? And the key piece of evidence I'm going to use is this. If this market was working well, I contend that people should stop going to these hospitals. Stop going to the really high-priced hospitals. If, so if I lose my job tomorrow and I have to get a, I have a heart attack where I need whatever the top line is there, right? So I have four stents, major complications. Don't go to Miami. Go to Jackson. It's right down the street, 700 feet away. And it's half as much, right? But somehow this isn't happening. And the question is why? Same thing goes for the added network. Stop going to these hospitals where there's these anesthesiologists. I'm sorry to any anesthesiologists here, uh, but you guys make a lot of money, so you're fine. Uh, don't go to these hospitals where there are these rogue anesthesiologists in the halls just like wandering around looking for patients that are out of network. Stop going to those hospitals. And somehow, the problem is that somehow they're not, right? That somehow we still hear these, uh, we still hear these stories about people going to these places and getting billed out of network. All right, um, so that's not enough, though. All right, that stinks. It doesn't seem right. It's unfair, and it doesn't seem right. All right, so that's the start. But what is causing it? That's what I think is the, the next logical step, is you have to be able to point to there's something about this market that's causing these problems. All right, so I'm going to point to a few. The first is information. All right, this is the obvious one. Have you ever tried to look up a list price for anything in a meaningful way? I have. It's impossible. All right? Some states will post a charge master that's worth, that's 10,000, 20,000 line items of billing code. I don't even know my diagnosis, let alone how it maps into some ICD codes and procedure codes, how to bundle that all together. That's worthless, right? So prices aren't salient, at least in a way that people other than you could actually use them, right? So that's number one. Number two, decisions are made under emergency situations. This is part of the reason why we think about healthcare differently and how, why we think of physicians differently. People are just inherently in these vulnerable situations. So I would contend, though, that we wouldn't be in a big issue if this was like other, other markets. So let's think about coffee. I buy coffee every morning. Whoop. I buy coffee every morning. Let's say nobody posts a price. And let's say I'm in a huge rush. Even if that's the case, if I randomly choose somewhere really fast, I might choose the wrong place, right? I might choose a place that costs 20 bucks a cup. That sucks, but tomorrow I make that same decision. And tomorrow, I know really quickly, even if it's split second, even if I don't know any new information, don't go to that place. Don't go to the high-priced coffee place. Pretty soon, a few days in, I know what the right answer is, right? That's not like healthcare. Healthcare, we can't learn by doing. When you have a bypass, you can't wait for the 15th bypass to sort of pick hospitals, figure it out, meet new doctors, you know, see what the amenities are like. And then by the end, you know, by that 15th one, you really nail the decision. Like, that's not going to work. And so that's just a fundamental piece of this choice that makes it a very difficult choice. And so my contention is that these things taken together make it unlikely that the market's at this efficient equilibrium. All right? So I think the outcome we're seeing isn't actually reflective of people's true preferences. And so I want to stop here for a second and just say, I think this is the key first step when you think about regulation. It's not that it's unfair. It's not that it feels wrong or whatever. It's that there's some reason where we think the outcome we're seeing isn't at an equilibrium. It isn't efficient. People somehow aren't making the choices we ought, they ought to be making, all right? So, Let's go through some policy options. The first one is a policy option that was proposed here by the governor of Florida, Rick Scott, who incidentally uh, should know this very well. He was the CEO of, I believe, the largest for-profit hospital chain in the country. So he knows healthcare. Um, he proposed legislation that would stop unconscionable pricing and price gouging, all right? And the way he's going to do it, he's going to say, look, we're just going to nip this thing in the bud. I'm not going to deal with defining exactly what's price gouging. We're just going to say, look, at a hospital, you get paid a bunch by Aetna, Humana, United, whatever. Take the average you get paid for everything. And you can't collect more than 15% higher than that from anybody. Okay. So that's one way of doing this. All right. So let's think about that. All right. So does this solve our problem of price gouging? Well, I mean, yeah. 
I guess. I mean, wherever there is price gouging, we just fixed it, right? You can't have this really high price. Wherever that might be, we didn't bother to find it, but we stopped it, certainly, to some extent. But, of course, we also limited every other price. All right, and so this is where alarm bells kind of go off for me, thinking as an economist, we just spent all this time talking about, here's an argument for a real market failure, and now we're wading into this different world. We're wading into something where we, it's not clear, at least so far, that there is reason to regulate, say, United's price at the University of Miami. Okay? Um, yeah, and so the, the, the reason that you, you think about this and it sort of starts ringing alarm bells is you say, well, the whole reason regulatory intervention in this case of, say, the uninsured makes, might make sense is that we don't think we're at the equilibrium right now. But we don't know that about this group, all right? And so we haven't gone through it yet, but let's go through those same three issues we talked about with the uninsured and see if they apply to this case. All right, so are there information problems? No. These are like the two most informed agents in the healthcare system. The United contracts with thousands of hospitals. This hospital contracts with a bunch of different carriers. They know all of the relevant price information. They all know all the quantity information, all the market power stuff. They know everything that you need to know. There's no clear information problem between these two groups. Is this an emergency? No, nobody's dying. They're in some sort of conference room probably. It's probably climate controlled, it's catered. You know, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with the situation. This is normal. Is it a one-time purchase? No, like I said. I mean, literally, these two groups will contract with each other every two years. So, I mean, they certainly do the same thing all the time. Aetna's contracting with a bunch of hospitals. This hospital's contracting with a bunch of different providers or with a bunch of different insurers, I should say. And so, I would say that while we could make a convincing case for these other groups, the uninsured, the out-of-network, that case is much, much less convincing in this group, the privately insured market, all right? And so the fact that it's much more difficult to make a case for a market failure makes me a little bit more worried about the implications of the policy. In this group, I should say. So let's talk about what those implications would be. Go, sort of go through the, the incentives. This is basically what comms do with all their time, just follow the incentives. Well, the first question to ask yourself is, the way this policy works is we're gonna say, all right, we're just gonna restrict the variation in prices. All right, remember you just average up everybody's price, United, Humana, whoever, we're just gonna restrict, can't be more than 15% higher than the average, so we're just gonna sort of condense things. Does that make sense in and of itself? I would say no. And the reason it doesn't make sense is I think there's very good reason for different prices at the same hospital. All right, so an example would be a PPO or a narrower network versus a wide network plan. A PPO, the whole business model, is I'm gonna go to a hospital and tell them, look, I've got all these patients, and I'm only gonna give them a few hospitals in this area. And so what that means for you as the hospital is that you're gonna get this consistent, large flow of patients through your doors. What does that mean? The hospital says, well, wait a minute, that's great, I love volume, so I'll give you, I'll, I'm willing to take essentially a, a smaller margin. So I give you a bigger discount. Well, some patients don't want that. They want access to all the hospitals. That's fine, but it's just more expensive because you don't have the bargaining power in that negotiation. So it's entirely possible that the same hospital has very different prices for two different insurance groups, right? So it's not clear why we want to restrict that. I would even say, and I would say it's particularly clear given how popular PPOs have gotten. And so let's think about taking that one step further. I would say this policy, if it were implemented, would explicitly discourage PPOs, right? The reason is that, remember how the, the cap works in this law. You can't collect more than 15% higher than your average price. Well, if I give one really large PPO a low price, what does that do? That reduces my average. What does that do? Reduces the most I can collect from anybody else. So all of a sudden, I'm really reluctant to give that big discount, okay? And so, to me, that is totally antithetical to the whole point of this law, right? The whole point of the law is to try and reduce prices, try and control costs. Well, now we're discouraging one of the cost containment mechanisms that we do have, right? And so the point is, this is the kind of thing you worry about once you start veering off into these realms where it's not clear what exactly is the problem, all right? So, so economists will call this a distortion of a market. So the option two, which will be a little bit quicker, is what's called a fair pricing law, all right? This is essentially the same thing, all right? The only difference is that it's actually targeted to the group that we've identified as having a market failure, or at least a plausible market failure, 
All right, so what these laws do is they say, you can't collect more from an uninsured patient than you collect from an otherwise similar insured patient. All right? So, are, are, are my, I'll assign it to you, our argument was that there's a plausible market failure in this one group. Let's just focus on the uninsured for now. There's very similar regulation for out-of-network. But in the uninsured, we say, God, they don't have prices. It's really urgent. You know, they don't do this very often. There's reason to believe that the choices they're making probably aren't quite optimal. It's not what they would want to do if they had all that information. Well, luckily, we can test this because a number of states have actually introduced laws like this. And so a co-author and I went ahead and did test it. And so the question is, well, what happens to care for uninsured? Because that's going to tell us all we need to know about what was the case before the law, right? So we've just said, we think there's room to improve efficiency. So what do we see? Well, sure enough, if you reduce the price for an uninsured patient, sure, hospitals care, right? They try and reduce costs. They try and be a little more cost conscious, get you out the door a little bit quicker, especially if you're a less severe patient is what you see. Uh, a few less procedures, mostly minor stuff. But when you look at the outcomes, which is really what we care about, there's no change in readmissions. There's no change in mortality. There's no change in complication rates. There's no change in you know, the use of high tech procedures when it's appropriate. And so the idea is that that's the outcome we really care about. And we seem to be getting that at a lower cost than we used to be getting it. And so I would say that evidence is consistent with the idea that there was room to improve the efficiency of that part of the market. OK? And so I'm going to wrap up just sort of with the takeaway more broadly is whenever you think about these policies, especially when it's in the context of some vulnerable group, some marginalized group, there's, you're always going to hear these sort of, oh, I don't like this. It doesn't feel right. It's sort of unfair. That's not enough. Right? That's not enough to, incur to, to uh, defend introducing some regulation. That's not to say it's not appropriate to do so. But it, you need to come up with a clear reason why the market, as it currently is, is not delivering the efficient outcome. That's step one. Step two is target the policy specifically at the market failure. Don't go through all this trouble and then just blanket, you know, regulate everybody. The, the, uh, the burden is on the regulators to define the problem and then answer that problem specifically, I would say. And the bonus thing I would say here is make it testable. All right. I really hate it when people introduce policies in ways that you have no idea if they work or not. So one idea here, the simplest idea, just let states do it. Let states do different things. That's the reason we know what happens with fair pricing laws. We had a bunch of states introduce slightly different laws at different times. All of a sudden, that's really easy to disentangle what works and what doesn't work. If you just do, say, same law, everyone at the same time, that's really hard to test. So I think step three here, the natural step three, which I actually didn't write, is make it testable and test it and update if you think somebody else is doing it better. I mean, that's the whole point. Have a bunch of different approaches, see what works, and copy what works. Because the end goal is not just to introduce a regulation. The end goal is supposed to improve the market. Um, and so that's, I think, pretty good time. Good. 30 minutes. Um, and so that's the end of what I got. So I'll take any questions. And if you guys want to just run off to lunch, that's fine, too. So thank you. of any hospital or state systems where there has been an attempt to address the information distortion caused by lack of transparent pricing? Yeah, definitely. And I, so I sort of picked on Governor Scott. I didn't, you know, I'm not trying to actually pick on him, but um, that bill that he was suggesting also had information in it. That's, I would say, necessary but not sufficient. It's important, but there's no way when you're having the heart attack, for certain things, it's just not going to help, but for a lot of things, it will. And so there is a lot of that, and that's one of the big things. There was actually a really big Supreme Court case that was important for this. There were these things called all-payer uh, databases, which is when states collect information from all of the insurers on what they pay for various things. That's a really great tool because you can use it to provide information to consumers about who's expensive, who's cheap, and so on. Well, there was this court case that said there's a, there's a, a, a law called ERISA that basically said anybody who's self-insured, that's any really large firm, doesn't have to provide that information anymore. So that's actually, for price transparency, that was a big uh, sort of hit, yeah. But the one nice thing about it is that transparency is like the one thing in healthcare that has the broadest support from everyone. So it's likely that there's probably going to be some work around. I think the, the Department of Labor can do something to, to try and sort of remedy that, but we'll see. Oh, yeah.
Does this work? Okay, great. First of all, thank you. You're a very engaging speaker. I enjoyed listening to you. Um, do you think it's possible to implement in this country a mostly cash-based healthcare system? Uh, where you, you have mean no ca- insurance? No, so you have catastrophic insurance. Mm-hmm. And possibly, so for I guess most people in this room, I don't want to make ex- assumptions, but it's like, let's say the under 35 crowd, most people not on meds. Really, no. unless something bad happens, you don't really need that expensive insurance. Even the yep. ones that you can get through, usually the one you get through med school is bad insurance anyway, and you're paying yep. a lot of money for it. So the issue comes down to, all of these issues come down to um, risk segmentation at the end of the day. If you offer these catastrophic plans, who's going to choose them? I'm going to choose them, you're going to choose them, everyone in this room is going to choose them. But the problem there is that we've now segmented healthy people away from sick people. And whether you like it or not, health insurance is 100% about uh, subsidization. I mean, that's the entire story. It's subsidization that most people seem to agree is appropriate because there's this unforeseen aspect that we, just because I'm young today, I might be sick and old tomorrow. And so that's the, that's the whole point of it. So the answer is sort of yes, sort of no. Yes, it's possible, probably not optimal, but maybe moving a, a touch more that direction might be, might be more optimal in the current situation. Yeah. But if we probably, if we extrapolate the financial models over time, even if you become that sick older person, you'll spend less even in your later years if you're just paying cash your entire life. That's, that's probably true, but people don't just care about amount spent, they care about risk. Okay, and so this is the, so the economic justification for insurance is not that the absolute amount you'd spend would be less, because we, optimally, it should be about the same, right? We price it out so that things sort of work out that way. But if I care about, I care about what economists call consumption smoothing, that is, I really don't like it when I have huge financial shocks. Okay, things that just totally demolish my income. That's a really big problem for me because then all of a sudden I lose my car, I, I lose my apartment. All these issues come, right? So I'll pay a premium. I'll pay more than I would in that cash based system to ensure that I never have to deal with that huge financial loss. So that's the one thing that you have to consider on that. It's not just the amount, it's the variance. So I, Thank I, you. I, I have to interject. How, you have to turn it on? Yeah, you have to turn it oh, on. Okay. I have to interject because I really, really disagree with the way you're defining insurance and that it necessarily involves cross-subsidization. It's a, very, it's a complicated um, issue, and I just, I, I'm pretty sure that one of my um, talks on what is and what is not insurance and, and distinguishing um, cross-subsidization or really a wealth transfer in that and the whole risk mitigation, it's complicated, and talk to me later about it, but... Um, Yours is a much more standard point of view. Yeah. But I just want to say there is a different way to look at that, and that is very important to understand and then make up your minds about what you think is right. Sure, I mean, I, and I'll take that one step further. I mean, there's a lot of people who define health insurance as prepaid health care, right? So there's, there's a lot of people who have health insurance plans that have, like, dental insurance, right? So there's no such thing, broadly speaking, as dental insurance. Dental is really, really predictable, right? Any reasonable person can predict dental care within the next couple years or so for most people. So the idea that we really need a lot of insurance for that is kind of weird. Mostly the reason we have dental insurance is because it's very heavily tax subsidized. So it's a way of paying your workers more without skipping the tax break. But there's a lot of insurance out there that is not insurance at all, I would say. In both of our definitions, that's just a pure pure transfer. doesn't have anything to do with the risk. Yeah. Sorry, it's strange that the guy with the microphone has a question. But uh, did you sir, your point about... Uh reducing risk and about making uh, prices more uh, stream, uh, more commonplace over time. Um, doesn't that ignore the moral hazard associated with insurance? While there may be less variables in the short term, overall it's sort of like the FDIC. You have more moral hazard, which leads to a large systemic collapse. Yeah, so there's two issues with insurance that are absolutely inherent in any kind of insurance program that you're going to run. There's moral hazard. If I have insurance, I'm just willing to spend more. There's just no question about it because I pay less on the margin. Absolutely. And number two, kind of what we were talking about earlier in this issue of maybe more catastrophic versus less catastrophic insurance, there's adverse selection issues, too. It's not just that I'll spend more. It's that I know I'm going to be somebody who's expensive. So I'm going to self-select into that insurance product that really covers me a lot. And so you can really see how combining those two things can absolutely lead you to a un- 
these these kind of markets are, are prone to spiraling incentives. That is, they kind of unwind because of these selection issues. And no question, that's absolutely an issue you have to deal with any kind of insurance market. Um, hi. Uh, so you spoke to spoke about a little bit earlier how you didn't really want to go into why there's been such a growth in that discount um, yeah. between list price and what hospitals are act what people are actually reimbursing. Can you can you um, dive into the theory a little bit of why yeah. people think that is the case? So it's so part of it is um, well the short answer is there's not a clear answer, but uh, part of it is that there is a certain um, self-perpetuation in this. So probably what happened is this was an issue that started in the 70s and early 80s. And so hospitals started raising prices a little bit, and they just sort of haven't deviated from the past. So that's part of it. Part of it is that people were taking advantage of uh, something called Ma Medicare outlier payments. Without going into the details, there's a way where you can sort of quasi-scam Medicare by making your costs of a certain stay seem really high if you inflate your prices a lot. So that's part of it. Part of it, people claim it's a negotiating tactic. Like if you go to a flea market, you start with a really high price, and you sort of settle on a higher price. I am less inclined to believe that because I just don't believe that Blue Cross is getting tricked by Jackson Memorial Hospital like that every single year. Uh, so I find that kind of hard to believe. Some people do genuinely claim it's, a, it's an attempt to try and get uh, money from uninsured. I also don't think that's the sole reason because if that were the case, set it to infinite, send it to it's a you know, two million dollars for a Tylenol and don't increase it. You know, why bother with this increase over time? But it's a lot of small reasons, I think, that sort of kind of add up to this weird long-term trend that nobody wants to deviate from, I think. I will say that every time I talk about this, I say I'm not gonna talk about it, and one of the questions is about it. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk, and it's great to meet another Emory alum. Oh, yeah. um, but I'm curious if you had any time to look at Oscar or Zenefits or where you think mm -hmm. the biggest opportunity for new and innovative approaches that startup companies could take are in this other side of insurance. So I was literally just out in uh, the Bay Area talking with some of the sort of younger donors at AAI, and that was like the one thing that they were talking about that I admittedly don't know that much about. But they were like, we, you absolutely have to put together a panel of Oscar, whoever, you know, all these startups, because apparently like, so. Stanford Business School, which is not going to be your typical business school, but everyone there is like half the kids are doing startup health stuff. Uh, and so the short answer is I don't really know that much about them, but I really need to know more about them. But um, hopefully in the near future we'll put together an event, in which case we'll certainly let you guys know, and then you can always live stream these things. So. So I'm not sure about the I'm not sure about like the causation part of um, so there's regulation and there's insensitive and sensitivity to the prices and mm -hmm. the value, but what would be the cause whether which one causes the other? But if we accept that um, the regulation comes after the insensitivity to the prices and the co and the uh, value. Um, it seems like the justification for the regulation is that there are things that people don't know. So then what we need to do to rectify that is um, assume that we can get in the minds of the people and see what, they, what their preferences actually would be. Yeah. And yeah. then that's going to fix it? Yeah. And so, I mean, this is part of any regulation you introduce. There's this aspect of it. And that's part of the reason why you want to really emphasize that Let's yeah. make sure we're not already in a situation that looks pretty much like a reasonable equilibrium outcome. Okay. And that's kind of, I think that's, that's sort of the justification for that. OK. Oh. So my point is just, how do we know that we're getting into the person's mind correctly? Yeah, I mean, this is always, I mean, so as an economist, uh, I will defend economists and say that we obviously know, don't worry about it. Um, okay. But uh, the real answer is, of course, that we don't really know. I mean, and so this is why any reasonable regulation is going to involve, uh, you're going to have to talk with hospitals. You're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, insurers. You're going to have to, because those really, at the end of the day, those are the people who know the most uh -huh. in this, at least in the market that we're talking about. And so you're going to have to do what you can, and you have to approximate. There's always going to be error, though. There's always going to be error, and that's part of the reason why it's so important to make sure we're not already close to what we think is the, is the right outcome. 
And then would you say that medicine is unique and that the consumer doesn't know everything about what they're paying no. for? No, I mean, it, so every market to some extent is unique. Um, there are a lot of markets where you don't know uh, all the information. But like I said, I mean, there's, it's more that if medicine's a little different in the emergency aspect of it, but there's other emergencies, right? So ships uh, sink, all right? Cargo ships sink. That's a unforeseeable sort of catastrophic thing. There's legal statutes to deal with what do you do with rescuing a ship's cargo versus people, right? So you can imagine that's a very similar situation. You could be similarly opportunistic and tell that guy whose ship just turned over, uh, I'll let you drown, or you give me your full life savings and I'll save you, right? So like that's one way you could do that. But the legal system has dealt with ways of, of uh, mitigating that kind of risk. And so I wouldn't say it's totally unique. Yeah, it's probably a unique combination of things, but no. I think, it's, I think the uniqueness of healthcare in that sense is a little overstated. It's not impossible. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.